Father's Day to all of you. We are so thankful and grateful for fathers. Amen? And for the Father God. We wouldn't be here without him. <laughs> so we just want to um, uh, let you know and invite you to come back tonight. We have, um, uh, we're going to have regular worship this evening, but then immediately following worship, we're just going to go outside and fellowship and have a good time and let um, the kids play and everybody fellowship together. So if you want to bring something to share as far as some kind of dish or food or fruit or something, um, come on and do that. If not, that's okay too. And we'll just um, fellowship together. So that's this evening uh, at 6 o'clock. And uh, also, today is the third Sunday. We want to remind everybody of that. So um, youth, stay in for the whole worship time. And then as soon as this worship is finished, we will go into the other building and carry on. So anyway, this, this day marks 25 years ago. Uh, the Brownsville outpouring. The, it's actually called the Father's Day outpouring. Um, they had no idea when they went into that service that morning that God was about to show up like powerfully. And I would encourage you um, to, to watch it on YouTube. They have it posted. I've gone back and watched some of those Brownsville uh, videos from way back when, and you can still feel the presence on those, and um, and it's really really intense and it's powerful and and it was just a, a wonderful thing to be a part of, and we say God do it again, <laughs> do it again bigger. <laughs> that's the one thing about God is He never does it the same, but it's always something that's more mind blowing, right? We are always like He's always getting better. There's a song that I'm stuck on lately. You keep on getting better, and that's what it is. He just keeps on getting better. So. Psalm chapter 91, um, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. And Taylor, if you could just get a clip of that song ready right after this psalm, I'd appreciate it. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. And their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen? Amen. Come on, everybody. Let's stand. And Taylor, would you just start that song? We are just so thankful. the 
whole world. In the whole world. I think we can get excited about our father today, right? We have the best dad in the whole world. And we, we kind of talked about this. Thank you. We, we kind of talked about this a little bit on Thursday night. But man, what an incredible picture. Jesus knew how to be a son. And that's what he taught us right? He taught us how to depend on the Father, and he taught us how to be sons and daughters, and that's the beauty of it. And he said in his prayer, and this is eternal life, John chapter 17, verse 3, that they may know you. He was talking to the Father. This is eternal life, that they might know the Father, amen? That they might know you, and that's awesome. And we can say no matter what your earthly dad is like, no matter how your earthly father has failed you, you still have the best dad in the whole world who loves you. And he set his value, the value that he set upon your life, your life, the value he set was his son. I, I want you to think about that. Your kid, if you said, I love everyone so much, I'm willing to sacrifice my kid. Wow. Wow. I don't know that I could do that, but that was the heart of God, and, and that's what he did for us, and that is truly the best dad that we could ever, ever imagine, that, that we have Father God, amen? Come on, can we just lift up our hands and just rejoice, and just rejoice in the fact that we have a Father that loves us, that we, because, because the Father made a decision to give his son. We have eternal life. And this is eternal life, that we might know the Father, that we might know you. Jesus, thank you. Thank you so much for being willing and obedient to listen to your Father and to come to this world and sacrifice yourself. God, thank you for sacrificing your Son for us, God. Lord, we can't even imagine, we can't even begin to wrap our brain around that, Lord, the, 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 just the immense cost. Lord, I'm, I'm reminded of the verse that says, how great is the love of the Father that he has lavished upon us, God, that we might become sons and daughters of God. Thank you for lavishing your love upon us. Oh, God, we lift you up this morning. We declare in the name of Jesus, you are a good, good Father. We declare in the name of Jesus that you are the best. Lord, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done. We thank you, Father God, for all that you've done. And Lord, we just want to honor you in this house today. We just want to bless you, oh God. And Lord, I pray this morning that you would heal daddy issues, that you would heal father failures, Lord, that maybe, maybe we've experienced in our lives, God, and we ask you, God, would you come in and would you heal wounds, Lord? Would you heal places, God, Lord, in us that are broken, Lord Jesus? And Lord, would you come and would you just let the healing balm of the Lord be poured out in those places, oh God? And Lord, right now, in the name of Jesus, we speak a blessing over every daddy in this room. Lord, we speak a blessing on every daddy and every daddy that is to be a daddy. In the name of Jesus, we declare over these men that they are mighty, that they are courageous, that they are, they are incredible men of God walking in integrity and truth and in the love and the fear and admonition of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we bless our men to be powerful and strong, to be the spiritual priests of the home that God has created them to be, to walk in authority and Lord in such an authority that the enemy cannot penetrate the household because he would have to get through daddy first and I thank you Lord that you have set these men to be the protectors and the watchmen on the wall of the home and Lord we thank you Jesus for giving us a watchman on the wall of this church a shepherd a daddy under you Lord and God we pray a blessing over our pastor this morning and we lift him up and say let the fire of God come out of his mouth in 
Jesus, for what you've done. And God, today we pray miracles to be poured out in this place. Come on, church, let's not be quiet. Let's just worship him. Let's lift him up. Come on, let's, let's just break through this barrier. God, we need you to come. We need you to come. Lord, we're looking for another outpouring. We're looking for another move, God. Lord, you keep on getting better, and we are hungry for what you're going to do next, oh God. We are hungry for a nation to be touched and changed, oh God. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, Lord, we lift you up. We bless you and we honor you. We magnify you and we glorify you, for you are worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. Come on, church. Come on, church. Let's bless him. Thank you, Jesus. You are worthy in this place. And everybody shouted. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Happy Father's Day. And uh, all you fathers, remember to pick up a Father's Day gift that's out there on the piano in the foyer as you leave, okay? And uh, just a, a memento from the church here to you. And uh, praise the Lord. Let's worship. Amen. <laughs> Sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to shine away from the earth to the cross. been since Easter since we did that song. So if you think about it, hey, they do that a lot. But not really. It's just, it may be that you just timed it to where, but anyway, praise the Lord. If there's a song to do a lot, that's the one. It's a good, good word. As we wait on you today for the offering, God bless you as you give. Listen, the Lord is going to just bless abundantly. Amen. As you give. We covenant with a heavenly father. How many know he's a good, good father? Amen? A good, good father. And he desires to pour out blessings upon his children. 
Uh, just quick update on my wife. Please, please uh, continue to pray for her, if you will. Uh, she did get a, a house visit from a doctor Friday, official doctor, MD, <laughs> also a close personal friend who actually got saved in one of our revivals. Isn't that cool? And so he came to the house and looked at her foot, and uh, he said he doesn't think it's broke, but we need an x-ray just to make sure because there's still a lot of swelling. So if you'll just uh, please uh, keep her in prayer and know that uh, that's why she's not here today. And she's like to keep her the keys. She's got this big gob of keys. And I got way down the road this morning and realized I didn't have keys to my office. I didn't even have keys to the church. So I'm out in the parking lot. Miss Jennifer was here. I said, Miss Jennifer, would you come let the pastor in the church? So anyway, <laughs> so <laughs> yes. So she asked me what the password was. So, uh, anyway, and uh, I won't uh, go into detail how we got into my office, but we were successful there too. So hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. I can't wait till she gets back up to operational speed because I'm not doing a very good job of her part. Uh, so anyway, I appreciate your prayers. Lord, we do bless this day, and we bless this offering, and we thank you that you are a loving Heavenly Father. You're a good God, a good Daddy, and we thank you for it, Lord. Multiply this as we give today, and we give you praise in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. So ever since we put Miss Jennifer in charge of the activities or the um, the blessing of the, the pastor and Stacy and everything. She's been doing a phenomenal job, and she came up and gave me our Father's Day gift for the pastor. Megan, how long have we been coming to this church? All right, so 10 years ago, well, one of the things that Pastor Steve says all the time is that, you know, you have to have your testimony. Your testimony is your strongest witness, and mine is 10 years ago I came to this church knowing who God was intellectually, but having no relationship with him. I came to this church, and Megan and I were in a rough spot, and God led us here to this man, this spiritual father of mine. And I'm not exaggerating. This is not a cliche saying to say that he saved my life, my spiritual life, that God used him to wield the sword of truth and to cut to the very deepest part of the issues that we had. That right over here, Pastor Steve talks about the gold star up here where he gave his heart to the Lord. Right here, Megan and I were standing. I was right here. Megan was on my right. And all the women came up and prayed for us. Linda was right behind me. Stacy was over on this side. Steve, you were right in front of me. There was no altar here at the time. You were right in front of me, and you put your hands on my head, and you were praying such a fierce prayer. I mean, it was, it, it was amazing. And since then, 10 years later, I'm still here. 10 years later, I'm still being cut to the bone by your skillful wielding of God's sword. You truly are a spiritual father. You truly are a man after God's own heart. That is not something that you say lightly to people. It was only ever said to about one person in the Bible. But you truly are passionate. You truly are in love with the Lord. And you love us unconditionally with such a fierce, protective, fatherly love. You are an awesome friend. You are an awesome parent. And you are an awesome pastor. Thank you very much. We love you here. Wow. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I just, to the Lord be all the glory. Amen. God bless you. Let's continue to worship. Thank you so much.
Saturday was silent, surely it was true. But since when possible, never stopped me. Friday's disappointment, this Sunday's empty too. Since when has a possible, never stopped you. This is the sound of the dry bones rattling. This is the phrase make a dead man walk again. Open the grave, I'm coming out. I'm gonna live, gonna live again. This is the sound of the dry bones rattling.
Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Lord, how true that is. Amen. There is no one like him. Praise God. Come on, just lift your hands one more time. Just bless him in this house today. We love you. We love you, Lord God Almighty. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful love. Thank you for being such a good, good Heavenly Father. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, praise team. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you so much. Awesome worship. Let me just say again, tonight we're going to have just regular time of worship, but then right after worship we're going to just go outside and just uh, throw some shoes and and uh, maybe some cornhole. And if anybody wants to bring a finger food or you want to bring your favorite drink, you can. It don't. All you ladies, don't get too excited. I know this is spontaneous. We're not expecting a 14-course meal or anything like that. But if anybody wants to bring something, you can. If not, I'm sure we none of us will starve. Okay? But we're just going to have some fellowship. I don't think we do that enough. I was, I was telling Pastor Stacy, when, when I grew up, we would regularly have, like, church picnics. We would get together, and we would fellowship, and we would, you know, and I just, they're, they're precious memories. I just, we don't do enough of it. And, uh, you know, we're well into the warm weather now, and we haven't done anything yet. And so uh, we, we're just going to do that tonight. It's not because I'm out of sermons. I actually have two already right now. Hallelujah. The other morning, I was uh, just in the Word, and I ended up spending about two hours writing a new sermon and, and uh, just... Uh, that's a good word. I'm excited about it. And that's not even today yet. I've got two more besides what I'm going to preach today. Hallelujah. That's a wonderful place to be. I love that. I'm glad that uh, God hadn't run out of sermons. Amen. And in fact, I'll call it a message, not a sermon, because I believe it, that's what it is. But we're so glad you're here today. So keep that in mind. Regular time, 6 o'clock. We'll worship from about 6 to 6.30 or so. Then we'll go out and have about an hour, hour and a half of just some good time of fellowship and be done before it gets dark. But just let the kids be kids and let the dads relax a little bit. And so we hope you can come and enjoy that with us. Uh, wow. There's, there's so much. There's so much that needs to be said and could be said on a day like today. And let me just say that... Uh, we are in danger in this generation. What's going on right now is a planned plot from hell. And don't anyone misconstrue what I'm getting ready to say. I hate and abhor racism, injustice anywhere I see it or find it. But I also know that the enemy of our soul is doing everything he can to conjure up and incite hatred to try to make things look worse than they are. I don't say that there aren't some evil actors, but I'm going to say this. Do not be deceived by what you see on the news media. You need to understand these people are being bussed in. They're being paid $200 a day to incite riots. And that is neither the heart of America, nor is it the true expression of America. Uh, I know that may not be popular to say, but it's the truth. And uh, are, are, are we perfect? No, we're not. But why don't you address some of the nations that are continuing to practice slavery to this day and are doing nothing about it? We did uh, have action. And what just disturbs me is the total ignorance of history. We did not become a nation when we landed here in 1607. We were still under the auspices of Great Britain, and they brought the slaves here. We did not become a nation until 1783. No, I did not misspeak. 1776, declaring our independence did not make us a nation. How many know you can declare anything, but you have to fight to make it so? Hello. Can I just say this? That's the same as being dad. Dad, you got to fight for your family. It doesn't mean you got a bad marriage. you got to fight to keep it. Hello. 
It doesn't mean you've got a bad family because there's problems. It means the devil's after your treasure, not your trash. Come on, somebody. I feel God in this place. He's after your treasure, not your trash. And if you've got a home and you've got a marriage and you've got a family, that's treasure and the devil wants it. And you've got to stand up and say, not here, not on my watch. You, there, nothing comes free. There's no such thing as a free lunch. You may get a free lunch from time to time, but it costs somebody. Hello. There's no such thing. It's free salvation, but it's not free. How many understand that? It costs Jesus his blood. Nothing is free. And so I hate and abhor when I see our nation being torn apart by lies. We did not become a nation until 1783 when Great Britain surrendered and, and acquiesced to the fact that we were now independent and free and sovereign. In 1787, we got a constitution. And in that very document, was the building blocks to end slavery. Our, 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 our hands were full. This needs to be said because it, it didn't just happen overnight. And to those in bondage, it's always too late. It's always not quick enough. I understand that. But in 1801 to 18. 06, 05, we had to fight the Barbary Coast Pirate Wars because our ships were being taken hostage by Muslim terrorists and our people were being enslaved. There were raiding parties that were coming in at 2 o'clock in the morning off the coast of America, snatching people out of their bed and taking them to slavery. We were paying ransom. The presidential campaign slogan for Thomas Jefferson in 1800, it was millions for defense, but not one penny for tribute. We were paying tribute to get our ships and our people back. How many of you know this? It's a crime that we don't know this. You're not being taught that in school, and you're certainly not being told that by the media. In 1812, Great Britain decided, oops, we made a mistake. We don't want you to be free. And they came back and fought us again. That lasted till 1815. And then in 1816, we had to go back to the Barbary Coast and deal with the Muslim terrorist issue again. And then the whole time, we were in the process of, of going through that thing of, of releasing and setting people free. And by 1830, we created a nation in Western Africa called Liberia, and we were releasing freed slaves to that country that they might be their own autonomous country. Was it fast enough? Let me say again, it's never fast enough to those that are in bondage. But it was being done. And we can all look back in hindsight and criticize those that lived then. We don't know how full their plate was, but it seems to me like their plate was pretty full. It seems to me like they had their hands extremely full. And so by 1861, when the Civil War happened and the tragedy that took place that 300 plus thousand lives were lost and freedom was granted and the Emancipation Proclamation took place and we're still not a perfect nation, but I want to say it again. What about the nations today that are still practicing slavery? Why are you quiet? I love what the, what the black gentleman said. He walked up to this group that was demonstrating, and he said, he said, do you really believe what you say? Oh, yes, oh, yes, do you really believe? He said, then how about all the black babies that are being boarded in our, our, our cities across America? And they didn't say nothing. They just stood there in stunned silence. He said, I thought so, and he walked away. Hello, where's your voice for those? Now, you can try to misconstrue this any way you want, so we're going to keep this on record, and we're going to record every word of it because I know how people can cut and paste and chop and extract, and we're not going to let that happen, okay? But I'm not going to be silent about the lies of the enemy. Part of my responsibility is to proclaim the truth, even if it's not popular. Hello. Hello. No, one's not, no one in any way is endorsing nor defending anything that's wrong or unjust. In fact, the church has been at the leading forefront of fighting injustice always. And it was even so in our nation. 
as ministers proclaim from the pulpit that no man should own another man. And we proclaim that again today. That whom the Son makes free is free indeed. But I'm going to tell you, there's a greater bondage than physical bondage. And that's not being said in a, a tongue-in-cheek way or in a flippant manner. But there is a greater bondage than physical bondage. There's a spiritual bondage that is far greater. Because a spiritual bondage will cost you your soul for eternity. So we want to be free physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and let's add financially in there. How many like to be debt-free? Amen? Amen. Debt-free. And if you are debt-free, stay that way. Now, if you're in the process, let it come quickly. I don't like this season right now because I try to practice living debt-free, and I'm in a season that it's not that way at the moment. I see it in the horizon. I see it in the future, but I want it to be there now. How many would like it to be there now? Amen? So please don't misconstrue anything I just said. And if you do, God will judge you. I'll just say that straight up. God will judge you because he knows the truth of what I just said, and he knows my heart. So I want to talk to you today using for a subject, When Fathers Fail, and the reason I said all that is to get to this point, this tearing down of monuments and trashing all of our founding fathers is a spiritual attack. Because the only way you can redirect a people is if you destroy their history. If you make them feel that what they had was not worth living for or fighting for or that their nation was not a good nation. Now, are there in history some people that are honored that possibly maybe shouldn't have been honored? That's a debate all of us could have. All I can say is this. When you start tearing down statues of George Washington, our president, the first president of our country, you're not doing anything to promote freedom. You're not doing anything to promote future generations of godliness. What you're doing is trying to destroy a sense of history from people that founding fathers who founded this nation on principles of godliness. And if you don't believe that, go to Washington, D.C. and look at all the scriptures on the monuments. So when you, when you do that, that's what you're striking at, the core of it. And I have scripture to back it up, and it's this. The Bible says that the children of Israel served the Lord as long as Joshua lived and all those that served with Joshua. And it said when those that served with Joshua died out, there arose a generation that knew not the great things God had done, and they went into captivity. That's what I'm telling you today. I'm telling you that our history is not perfect. No one's history is. But I'm telling you, woven through our history, history is the unmistakable hand of Almighty God. And when you take that away from a group of people, then you make them think there's nothing we're fighting for. Then they will surrender what they have without a fight. And that's communism. A very telltale tell sign of what's happening today. Uh, gentleman who's a local commentator on a station out of Washington, D.C. He said, I have people in my building that are immigrants from communist country. And he said, they came up to me and they said, this is not new what we're seeing. This is the way communists take over a country. They said, this is the very thing they did in Russia and the other Soviet countries of satellite countries they begin the same way and he said we've seen it before and it's not good so let us pray for unity let us pray for healing let us pray that God touches our land amen that we be united by the presence of God that we be united by the spirit of God and that we proclaim truth because truth alone can make us and keep us free so if you have your Bibles today, 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 22, 
And starting with verse 13 says, Go ye, inquire of the Lord for me, and for the people, and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that, that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book, to do according unto all that which is written concerning us. And then you go to Psalms chapter 78. And starting with verse 3, the Bible says, Which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord, and his strength and his wonderful works that he hath done. Notice that verse. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come. Here the Bible is talking about people yet to be born. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers, everybody say our fathers, that they should make them known to their children. You see, it's true that the mother guides the home, but the father sets the direction or the course. And if the father doesn't set the course, the whole home will go off course and out of direction the father sets the direction and the course of the home and the mother guides the home according to the course and the direction that's been set the father is to be the example to the home let me ask you this question if someday you're called on to eat the fruit of your example are you going to like what you eat? Are you going to like what you eat? Father, if you're full of bitterness, that's going to transfer to your sons. You don't even have to tell it. It's not taught, it's caught. Will you come back and eat the bitter fruit of your example, or will you eat the fruit? the sweet fruit. I don't know about you, but the older I get, the less I like to be tormented and worried to death. So how about, can I hear an amen? And I don't want, I don't want, hello, I don't want my offspring nor their offspring coming back to torment me. And thank God that ain't happening. They'll come back to bless me, but I want it to stay that way. Can I get a witness? And you want it to stay that way. About the time you get to slow down and not work as hard as you had in the past. You don't want to be aggravated and tormented the rest of your time. You want to be blessed. Amen. I'm just saying. One day you're going to come back and eat the fruit of your example. So look now. If the fruit ain't tasting sweet now, change the root. Because the root determines the fruit. Hello? Change the root. So let's read on. Verse 6, that the generation to come might know them, even the children which should be born, who should arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments, and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright, and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. And forgot his works and his wonders that he had showed them. Marvelous things did he in the sight of their fathers in the land of Egypt and the field of Zon. That's verse 12. And then we're going to jump verse 57. But turned back and dealt unfaithfully like their fathers. They were turned aside like a deceitful bow. And then in Jeremiah 9, 14. But have walked after the imagination of their own heart and after Balaam which their fathers taught them. So the children of Israel failed to pass on to their children the great things God had done, failed to remind them of the many miracles. So what happened is a whole generation arose that didn't know the true history. Think how crazy it is that you could have been at the Red Sea and watched the whole thing open up, marched across on dry land, 
stood on the other side of the bank and watched Pharaoh and his entire army drown. And by the way, they have found artifacts in that area of, of broken chariots and all of the debris. And, you know, naturally you didn't hear about it. They're going to shut that up. But imagine you've seen all of that. And you get in such a backslidden state that somebody can actually take jewelry, gold, and throw it into a fire, and out jumps a calf. Okay, that's how they said it just popped out. And then the statement is made, these are your gods that brought you out of Egypt. And you sat there and swallowed that horse hockey. Somebody shout yes. And nobody, nobody calls their hand on it nor corrects. Everybody just enters into this great big wild party that turns into, you might as well say, a drunken orgy. The Bible says they got naked and they danced. They danced around this calf. No wonder Moses got torqued. No wonder when he came down off the mountain after having been with a holy God. He's like really stirred up and he's like, what is this in my hands? What are you doing? And he throws it down and he, Moses is the first one to break the Ten Commandments. All ten at one time. Just a little humor. But can you blame him? He takes the golden calf. He grinds it into powder. He throws it into the water and commands them to drink. And then whether you know this or not, a chemical reaction to gold powder is if you throw it into water, it turns the water scarlet red. It becomes a type of the blood. But he makes them drink it. He goes back up on the mountain again, part two, because they so aggravate him. 40 years of, I'm, I'm going to tell you something, listen, 40 days of being in the presence of God can be ruined by a bunch of backslidden knotheads. Come on, somebody. You've got to watch who you keep company with. You get the greatest blessing in church there is and just get around some backslidden knotheads and I've got to get back to church again. Take me back. Amen. I want to go to church. Take me back. Some of you need to live in church with some of the family. Let me look this way. I don't want somebody to think I'm... Uh, it's just a general statement to all those not here in the building but online. You need to live in church. You need to, like, see if they'll put up a dormitory for you. Rent out a room. But they just, like, totally torqued him out. But how could they? And Baalism persisted. That wasn't a one-time thing. If you study the history of Israel, Baalism persisted. Who did Elijah confront on Mount Carmel? The prophets of Baal. The goddess Ashtaroth, who was the goddess wife to Baal, the false god. 450 prophets of the grove, 400 prophets of Baal. Jezebel. Jezebel. Baal. I'm not trying to do no southern draw. I'm just telling you. Jezebel. Listen. I know, look, it may, it may seem at times like, you know, Pastor, you're beating a dead horse. You just keep getting on this. I'm going to tell you something. Listen, I have to. And not only does it burn in me, but it's an, it's an admonition from Scripture that I remind you that you not forget. And all through, through Scripture, it says, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget. Why? Because people forget. And when you tear all down the memorials, when you tear them all down and get done, then you can raise a generation and teach them anything. It's called history revisionism. And it's always in the communist playbook. Always. I know what I'm talking about. And unless you've done the study I've done, then I doubt you know that. Deuteronomy 5, 26, For who is there of all flesh that have heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of the fires? We haven't lived. 
Go thou near and hear all that the Lord our God shall say. And speak thou unto us that the Lord our God shall speak unto thee. And we will hear it and do it. And the Lord heard the voice of your words when you spoke unto me. And the Lord said unto me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people which they have spoken unto thee. They have well said all that they have spoken. Oh, that there was such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always. That it might be well with them and with their children forever. But how many know it wasn't? It wasn't well with them. It wasn't. Why? Because they didn't. In fact, when Moses got ready to die, he said, you need to continue to serve God. He said, and this is what's going to happen, and this is because you're not going to. Boy, that's not a real inspiring speech, is it? You've spent your whole life with these people pretty much, or you might say a third of your life because he spent 40 years learning the ways of the world, 40 years learning the ways of God, and then 40 years putting into practice what he learned in the first 80. 40 years grown and raised in the courts of Pharaoh, 40 years on the backside of the desert, and then 40 years leading the children of Israel. And they so aggravated the tar out of him that he couldn't get into the promised land. Isn't that amazing? Wow. But he did make it. He made it on the Mount of Transfiguration later. He was there, Moses and Elijah, and Jesus. Hello. And Peter, James, and John. Pete, Jim, and John. And these words which I command thee, Deuteronomy 6 shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, shalt talk with them when thou sittest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou restest, risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. Man, that sounds extreme. How could you do all of that and forget? You got something swinging between your eyes? You've got the works of God written on the post of your house. You're supposed to be telling all this to your children. Your children are supposed to know. Don't, don't leave it up to the public school system nor the colleges or universities of our day to teach them because they're not going to teach them right. And whether they roll their eyes at you like they know it all, you know, there, there is a disease that afflicts all teenagers. You can get mad at me all you want, and you can say, no, not me. There is a disease that afflicts all teenagers. It's called know-it-all-itis. Know-it-all-itis. I know everything. I'm brilliant. I'm a genius. There was a mistake at the hospital. There's no way to simpleton such as my mom and dad could have had such a brilliant child as myself. I should run a DNA test because there's no way we're related. You can say whatever you want. You know, it's true. Most of you have been afflicted with it. If you'll be honest, there was a time in your life when you knew it all. Some of you are still somewhere in between there. But I promise you there's coming an event in your life that God will humble you down and you'll finally just say, God, I know nothing that I need to know. I am a son of David. Dumb, dumb. Help me, Lord. I need your help. Because life will do that to you. Life will show you you don't know all you think you know. Ronald Reagan had such a way with words. He, 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 he could hit people with a velvet brick. And they'd be probably half an hour later before they realized just what he'd really said. He said, it's not that my Democrat friends know nothing. He said, it's just that they know so much that's not the truth. It's not that this generation doesn't know anything except they know so much that's not the truth because they've been fed lies. And don't you buy into them. And may God grant you the discernment to know the difference. But there will finally come a place in your life when you realize I don't know, need, I don't know near what I need to know. 
I, I'm not sure when it happened. I wish I could point to a magic age. But I finally reached a place where I just stopped feeling compelled to correct every conversation I was a part of and fix whoever was talking. The temptation still arises from time to time when I really do think I know something, but it quickly passes. And I've learned sometimes the best way to correct or fix something you know is not right is just to ask a few questions. Just act like you really don't know the answer, and I don't mean in a deceitful, lying way, but maybe I should phrase that in a different way because I'm not into acting, but Maybe you could just pose those questions that would cause them to, oh, well, like one person said recently to me, oh, I never thought of it that way. See, there's a lot of things you've never thought of that way. And that way makes all the difference in the world. So we need dads to be an example. Can I get a witness? So all of these scriptures speak of that. And then in verse 10 it says, and It shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land, which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities, which you built not, and houses full of good things, which you filled not, and wells dug that you didn't dig, and vineyards and olive trees, which you didn't plant. And when you've eaten and you're full, then beware lest you forget the Lord which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. See, that's the problem. That's the problem that comes with a blessing. A blessing will make you feel arrogant. And if you're not careful, it'll deceive you into thinking that you gained it all by your own merit or your own effort or your own just deserts. This is what I deserved. And we better always stay humble and realize it's the blessing of the Lord that makes rich and adds no sorrow there too. And even if you think you got it by the labor of your hands, one unseen bug could put you flat on your back and take you out of this world. And lest anyone misconstrue some of the things I've said in the last week or so, I have never said, nor do I say, that this virus isn't real. It's real, and it's killing people. I'm saying the fear with it is greater. The fallout of canceled surgeries that needed to happen, the suicides, the destruction of people's finances and their businesses to where they can't recover. But I was with a doctor friend of mine the, just the other day at, he told me about a 50-year-old man in pretty good health that came down with this stuff, and he went away from here. He wasn't in his 70s. He wasn't in his 80s. He was 50. So do we need to be careful? Absolutely. Wash your hands. Hello. Be careful. I think that was my first post COVID-19 hug this morning to Brother Jimmy. But, Brother Jimmy, we're good. I feel well and you feel well. and uh, Felt good to have some human contact. Whether you believe it or not, we were made to interact with one another. We, we were actually made to. I'm not saying we shouldn't use caution. I'm just telling you the fear and the torment is worse than the actual. So let's be careful. Amen. We don't just overblow. But what will happen if you're called upon to eat the fruit of your own examples? It's been said we're one generation away from losing the faith. The same man that wrote the old rugged cross, George Bernard Shaw, son became an agnostic. How under the same roof, from a hymn that's right up there with probably the top ten of all hymns of all time. How could that man produce an agnostic? You see, everybody has got to live their own life. Daddy can't 
have enough faith for everybody else, but daddy better set the direction for the home and then pray that it not happen because we're one generation away from losing the faith. The phone rang at 4 o'clock in the morning, waking out of a dead sleep. He fumbled around on the nightstand, grabbed the phone. This is back in the days of landline. He mumbled hello into the receiver to hear on the other end the local sheriff of the small town that he lived in. Called him by name. Said, I'm sorry to have to disturb you at this time of morning, but there's been an accident. Your daughter was involved in I'm so sorry to have to tell you she didn't make it. And you're needed at the emergency room to meet with the coroner and make positive identification and sign the papers to release the body to the funeral home of your choice. Stumbling out of bed like he was living a nightmare and hoping somehow this is part of a dream. He went out the door en route to the hospital. And it just so happened that en route to the hospital, he came across the scene of this accident. They were clearing the debris off of the road and sweeping the broken glass out of the highway. And he walked up to the mangled car that his daughter had been driving, riding in, and he looked inside and on the back floor was a third of a bottle of whiskey. He picked it up. He was not a godly man. He was not a Christian. He was not a churchgoer. He picked it up and he held it till his knuckles turned white and he shook it and he said, if I could just get my hands on the person that sold my baby this bottle, I'll rip him apart. He threw the bottle back down on the floorboard in disgust. He got in the car. He went to the hospital. Everything was like a cloud of, of just, I'm in a fog. And he went through the grisly details of looking on that slab and identifying his daughter. As the first rays of pink were beginning to emblaze in the eastern sky and he turned into his driveway just as it was beginning to get light, he opened the door and he went down into the den where he always went when he'd had a tough day. Walked over to the liquor cabinet that he kept in the den, the wet bar that he had, that he'd made in his man cave. And when he opened the door to reach in for a bottle, he saw a post-it note. It was the last note that he would ever have in his daughter's handwriting. And it said, Dad, we knew you wanted us to have a good time, so we took one of your bottles, love, and she signed her name. when you have to eat the fruit of your own example. I pray God it's not bitter. If they have your priorities, will they make it? You teach by your lifestyle, your example, and your speech. And you're going to teach them. And they're going to learn. And they're going to come back to you to bless you or haunt you. It is no small wonder that 70% of all young men incarcerated today in America came from fatherless homes. That's not statistics from the church world. That's from the police crime gazette. A young person is 300% more likely to be involved in illegal activities and crime if they are raised in a fatherless home. The rage that is found in so many today 
is directly related to the absence of their father. That's another sermon for another time. I'll just throw this in in passing. No extra meat. But the one case, the first court case, straight out of the gate for King Solomon to show just how wise God had made him involved two babies from two different women living in the same house. One had overslept her baby, rolled on top of it, smothered it during the night, realized what she did, switched the baby, tried to pull it off, and Solomon in his wisdom called for a sword and said, we'll just divide the living baby and the real mother. The real mother said, no, 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 just give it to her, just give it to her. The mother that had done the switching that knew it wasn't her said, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. And he said, don't kill anything, this is the real mother. But that whole story is given to us because there's an absence of a father. A father will always bring clarity and identity of the children. I know, listen, listen, hello, this ain't Mother's Day, so you just, just, just cowgirl up, okay? This is Father's Day. But I'm going to tell you something, ladies. I know you've had to do a lot, and I know you're awesome, and I know you're all that in a bag of chips, but I'm going to tell you something. God so designed this thing that your world doesn't work very good if you get rid of your man. I know you think you're great and independent and you can do it all, but I'm going to tell you something. That's just the way it is. And you can, get, uh, you can get mad at me, you can get offended at me, but your argument's not with me, it's with God. God designed this thing. And it doesn't work very good when we take one key component out of the picture. Especially when that key component is supposed to be called to be the spiritual priest of the home and set the direction and guide and course for the home. Isn't it amazing that if dad goes to church... 90% of the kids will go. But if mom goes and dad doesn't, only 30% of the kids will come. But the homes where both mom and dad go, 90% of the kids go. Isn't that interesting? Wow. That's pretty good. So, it's not only a word that challenges, but I hope it also encourages. Don't think because there's difficulty that, you know, I've got a bad family or I've got a bad marriage or got, no, I'm, can I say it one more time? The devil is after treasure, not trash. He's after that which is still valuable. So the children that had not been told or reminded turned to the gods of Ashtaroth, Molech, Adramelech, and Baal. Too many children today that are not having a godly influence are turning to the gods of money, materialism, illicit sex, drugs, and booze. Hello. The backslidings of the fathers are visiting this generation. There's a little boy by the name of Johnny. I mean, how many know there's been a lot of Johnnies? Okay, he's been. But this, this really was his name, Johnny. He, Johnny loved to go to Sunday school. He just loved to go to Sunday school. Johnny had a problem in Sunday school. He'd fall asleep. Finally, the teacher one day just got aggravated with Johnny falling asleep. Said, Johnny, if you're just going to come and sleep, don't bother to come back. So Johnny didn't bother to come back. What the teacher didn't know in her ignorance and her insensitivity was Johnny came from a pretty rough background and a really rough family, and his daddy would keep him awake all night on Saturday night working him because he was so full of the devil he really didn't want Johnny to go to church and he'd just work him and work him all night long but Johnny would persist and go anyway though he was dog tired Johnny grew up without any more influence of Sunday school and church Johnny became a household name Johnny became so well known that his name is still mentioned yet today. Though almost a hundred years have passed, Johnny is still remembered as John Dillinger. Famous gangster on Chicago's South Side.
What will happen if you call on to eat the fruit of your example? You know, we have the greatest father ever outlined for us in Luke 15. That's another whole sermon. Won't go there. Just give you a couple quick salient points. The father in Luke 15 gave him the right to choose, never stopped caring, was ready and willing to forgive and restore him to a place of sonship and didn't throw it up in his face. Can I get a witness? He truly forgave. His son made very foolish decisions, but he came to himself and learned a very valuable lesson. There's no place like home. Can I get a witness? No place like father's house, but he learned from a daddy that it's not too late to change your course. Isn't that awesome? Probably one of the most moving things that had ever happened to me in all my years traveling on the road. I went to a church in Pennsylvania, preached a revival. On the closing night, I'll never forget, on the closing night, it wasn't part of the text, it wasn't part of the sermon notes, it was extemporaneous, it was off the cuff. I made this statement. I said, Dad, you might go home tonight from this service, and your 16-year-old daughter might come up to you and say, Dad, I'm pregnant. I said, don't kick her out of the house. I said, at that moment, she needs you more than she ever needed you. I said, you kick her out of the house, and all you're going to do is, 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 is secure the fact that she may never get back on track. I said, that's when it's time to be dad. And I said, you need to tell her, I forgive you. I don't agree with how this happened, but we're going to get through it. Eight years later, I went back to that church. Normally, didn't stay away that long. Normally, I, about... Please, I'm not trying to brag. I'm just telling you. I'm being grateful to God, but I'm telling you the truth. About 90 to 95% of everywhere we went, we were asked back. I actually had a circuit. Many churches I'd visit yearly. Stayed on the road for 32 years. I went back to this church for eight years. It was not part of my regular circuit, but they decided after eight years, they wanted me to come back. At the close of a service, Man walked up to me, he had a young boy by his side. He said, Brother Steve, he said, eight years ago you were here in your closing service. You said if you go home from this service and your 16-year-old daughter comes at you and says, Dad, I'm pregnant, don't kick her out of the house. Put your arms around her and love her and help her. And he said, I want you to know that exact same thing happened to me that night when I went home from church, from this revival. And he said, I took your advice. And he reached over and he squeezed that young man and pulled him into himself. And he said, I want you to meet my seven-year-old grandson. He's my best friend. That's the kind of dads we need. Anybody can point out your failures. Anybody can look at how you did it wrong. But everybody needs to be told when they've done it right. This is kind of humorous, and some of y'all may even like roll your eyes or old boy or whatever, but I'm going to tell it anyway because it's, it, it happened. It's true. I have a cat. Most of you know that. Most of you know I really love my cat. Make no apologies for it. He's my buddy. He's named Jedediah, which means beloved of the Lord. He caught a mouse the other day. He fooled around with him and let him go. And mice are very destructive. And he fooled around with him and let him go, and that thing was near the garage. And I talked to him. I said, boy, I said, I don't want you to play with these things and let them go. I said, I want you to kill them. I don't want, you, I don't want them in the garage. You need to... Do your job. God's my witness. This is the truth. That happened like two days ago. This morning early. I let him out. About 7 o'clock in the morning, I heard him calling me. There's a whole different meow. I heard him calling me. I walked out and looked. He was laying there on the garage floor with a dead mouse in front of me looking at me. I walked over to him. I started loving him. I said, good boy, good boy. He's just eating it up. He's just... I'm just like, listen, everybody needs to be told when they've done it right. If all you do is point out when they messed it up, 
All you're going to do is every time you open their mouth, they're going to cringe like, what did we do wrong this time? Did anybody hear what I said? He got up from there. I said, go get daddy another one. <laughs> he got up there. He goes out. Another thing I'll never forget. Boy, I'll tell you what, this just tears me up when I think about it. But it's true. I was preaching a revival at the close of the service one night. I said, how many of you in this church, how many of you in this building tonight are still looking for a word of affirmation from your earthly father? He's never once hugged you, pulled him to to you, to himself, and said, son, I'm proud of you. Hands begin to shoot up all over that building. Men with white hair. That it was very clear that their daddy was no longer on this planet. Died never hearing once, I'm proud of you. Died never hearing once, son, you're doing a good job. My dad was a little late to the party on that. I'm just being honest. Don't get mad. Oh, there he goes again. No, I'm not throwing him under the bus. Just hold, hold, hold steady. My dad was a little late to the party on that. But when I took over as pastor here, he would continually tell me on a regular basis, usually by phone, but still tell me, son, you're doing a good job. He never once tried to tell me how to pastor this church, never once told me I was doing anything wrong. The only time he ever picked up the phone to give me any advice was when I did this platform and he was concerned that I would trap moisture behind the platform in that wall and he didn't want us to have a mold problem. I said, Dad, I'm putting it in portable so we can slide it back if there's ever water issues and air it out. He said, oh, good, son, good. And I'm using treated lumber. Oh, good, son, no, that's good, okay. That's all. Don't live your whole life with somebody waiting for your affirmation. I close with this story. There's more I could say, but I close with this story. Dad came home after a hard day's work, and this was back in the days when newspaper was pretty much king, and you got pretty much all your information, and this dad... One of the things he looked forward to after a hard day's work was sitting on the porch and reading the daily local newspaper just to unwind before supper. His little five-year-old boy, wide-eyed and full of wonder. And By the way, this is back in the day before preschool and kindergarten. You know, it, it dawned on me the other night on the way home from church. I've just, I, I was so thrilled. I realized that I was so smart as a child, I, I skipped two years of school. <laughs> I didn't go to preschool nor kindergarten. I started in the first grade. <laughs> I wish some of y'all laughed just a little bit. Just, they didn't have that back then. Thank you, Jesus. Okay? I'm sure glad I skipped it because I didn't enjoy the other 12 that much to add two more on top of it. But he come bursting out on the porch. Daddy, Daddy, will you play ball with me? Will you play ball with me? So glad to see his daddy. Said, Not now, son, I'm busy. About two minutes later, he comes back. Daddy, Daddy, will you play ball with me now? Will you play ball with me now? Daddy says, Not now, son, I'm busy. Third time he comes back in two minutes. The dad loses it. He tears out a whole page out of the newspaper, full page of the world, of some global concern of network communications. And he tore it out, the whole page, tore it in shreds and threw it down. He said, I said not now, I'm busy. When you put that back together, then I'll play ball with you. Five minutes later, the little boy came back. He said, Daddy, Daddy. And he said, Son, I told you. And then he looked, and there standing there with a big smile on his face was his little boy holding the paper with the world all taped back together. Everything matched. All the words was together. 
It was all crudely taped, but it was taped and it, it fit. And the father in amazement said, you didn't do that. That's not fair. Mommy helped you and that's not part of the deal. Oh, no, Daddy. No, Daddy. I did it all by myself. I did it all by myself. I did it all by myself. And the man said, that's impossible. You didn't even start a school yet. You can't read. How could you did it all by yourself? He said, it was easy, Daddy. It was easy. And he turned the paper around. And there was an ad for a men's clothing store. And there was a full page ad of a man standing in the suit. He said, Daddy, it's easy, it's easy. He said, when you put the man together, the world goes together. That's what's wrong. And no world will ever be together. Your world, my world, anybody else's world. As long as the man's not put back together. Look. It's always easy to criticize the one calling the shots and the one that the buck stops here and the one who ultimately all has to answer for whatever happens. So about right now would be a real good time to pray for the father figures in your life, both in government and spiritual authority. Because the Bible says, pray for those that are in authority that you might lead a quiet and peaceable life. How many like a quiet and peaceable life? I'm going to tell you something. Listen, quietness and peace is not overrated. I want to just tell you it's not. Quietness and peace is pretty good stuff. Don't be deceived by all the smoke screen of the enemy. Don't be deceived about the agenda. Understand that there's a demonic component that wants to rip this country apart and don't you participate in it. God's called us to a higher standard. God's called us to a higher way. So where there's seeds of hatred, let us sow love. Where there's strife, let us sow peace. Where there's ill will, let us do something that promotes goodness and kindness. Amen? And may God help us. Because when fathers fail, the next generation is destroyed. Bow your hearts with me. Father, I thank you today for your word. It's forever settled in heaven. It is a lamp under our feet and a light to our path. God, I just pray that you would go before us and help us. That you would keep us and lead us and guide us and direct us. And the Lord, you would help, help every one of us that has the title of dad. To live up to that awesome example. And Lord, when we fail, when we miss the mark, when somehow we've failed to set the right example, may we go back to the place of failure and correct it and set the course again. For there's others that are following and others that are watching and others that will be ultimately blessed or harmed by our misguided direction. So Lord, today, we yield the course and direction of our lives to you. And we pray an anointing upon dads to live out their lives in godly examples. We ask you to help us today. In Jesus' mighty name. I wonder how many dads in this place today would just lift a hand and say, I received the word today and I'm going to ask the Lord to help me be that kind of dad. God bless you. Thank you for those hands. I received the word today. I'm going to ask the Lord to help me to be that kind. And that doesn't mean you haven't been to a certain extent. But how many know there's always room for improvement? Always. Stand with me if you will. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Just go ahead and turn that up a little bit. I'm going to ask you together. We're going to have a prayer of blessing. I want to remind you about tonight.
we're just going to have a good time of fellowship, some worship, and then just some fellowship. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, Lord. Oh, yes, you are, Jesus. Hallelujah. Perfect in all of your ways to us. Perfect in all of your ways. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Come on, just lift your hands and stretch them this way. Lord, I pray a blessing on your people today. I pray they be blessed going out and coming in, rising up and sitting down. I pray the blessing on the labor of their hands, that everything they touch would prosper. I pray for divine Psalm 91 protection, that no plague would come nigh their dwelling. I pray that their offspring, their sons and daughters, would be taught the ways of the Lord. And it would never be said of us, there arose a generation that knew not the great things that God had done. So Lord, today we recommit ourselves. And Lord, we ask you to help us as a people and as a nation. And we'll give you praise. Hallelujah. All of God's people said, we love you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. It's who you are, loved by you, who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Bless your name, Jesus. Bless your name, Lord. Hallelujah. Perfect in all of your ways. Perfect in all of your ways to us. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, praise your name, Lord. God bless you. Greet one another. And however that makes you comfortable, I know we're still practicing, so but God bless you. We love you. Come back tonight, 6 o'clock.